this section we are going to look at the evolution of evolutionary thinking, examining some of the important ideas and individuals that influenced Darwin. It is a long century, some people talk about an extended 19th century, and so we're going to first of all just contextualize some of the events that happened just before Darwin were born, was born because they are really important for understanding some of the societal changes that he was grappling with. I already talked about the Industrial Revolution, I talked about the Colonial Project and which also led, for example, James Cook um, landing at Poverty Bay. We mentioned the struggle for independence that started around those times, for example, the Declaration of the Independence of the United States, and then, very importantly, the French Revolution, with the wide-ranging changes that this revolution had on political thinking within Europe. So this is the technological, historical, political context in which um, a lot of these ideas were taking shape. So let's have a look at some of these people and some of their you know sketches of the ideas that they brought to the study of evolution so we have to start off with some of the theologists so these are people that look at religion as a, and study religion first of all we have to mention William Paley it's very interesting that even today um, his face is opposite Darwin's in, in Oxford and he published a very important book called The Nathru Natural Theology in 1802, in which he argued that the world and, and um, things, you know, like geology, um, even species, might change. But the important attribute is that there's always a law that is created and ordained by God. So he was very open to the idea to that that there might be changes in 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 nature but all of these changes can be always led back to some divine law that is independent of of anything else that is happening paley is also important because he first brought up or he popularized the watchmaker analogy or metaphor so that you know he argued that if you find uh, a watch in the sand and it is buried there then there has to be a god that created that watch so that was an important argument talking about for example fossils that were unearthed during that time so you can imagine if you believe in god and then suddenly um you know like all these uh, geologists started to finding all these fossils of animals that clearly were extinct because there were no currently living animals that had um, those bone structures that created a lot of problems and so he came up with this idea that even you know like the you know like metaphor of a watch even if you find a watch buried somewhere it has to be created by someone and that someone has to be God this is also uh, a metaphor that other contemporary researchers would um, pick up very um, in, in, in our current thinking so you might have heard of the blind uh, watchmaker argument and we will revisit that in, in due course in this in this course so but this is just to give you an idea that some of these arguments that were created um, you know at the beginning of the 19th century are still around today and biologists philosophers psychologists refer still back to some of these debates from that period. So he was really important for setting up uh, a religious argument for evolutionary change which always required God. A second person that is really important for Darwin is John Stevens, ha Stevens Hanslow because he was the, um, the teacher that would inspire Darwin to go out into nature and explore um, nature's design through observation. So he was important because he 
he saw the study of uh, nature as a way of uncovering God's or divine laws. So that was a very important um, conceptual idea for Darwin that influenced how he was interacting with nature early on in his life. And we have to also mention Th Thomas, uh, Thomas Malthus. He is a very important thinker. He was a priest but also an economist and he wrote a very very famous essay in 1798 which initially was published anonymously but soon after it was revealed that uh, it was written by him which talked about the principles of population and, and population pressure and what kind of effects they may have on, on human populations. So he speculated and, and he created some mathematical formulas looking at the resources that are available in a specific environment and then you know, like the demands that are placed on those resources by animals and people living there. So his argument was that even though you know like if there are plenty of resources available then humans or other animals as well you know like they were just procreate and so the population would increase which then leads to you know like poorer and poorer living condition uh, worse and worse lif living conditions and then this creates misery so this argument really caught on and this led to for example the census act in uh, 1800 which was um, the first proper census carried out in in England and so the the ideas from Malthus influenced a lot of um, thinkers around that time so if you've heard of Karl Marx he was also very strongly inf influenced by Malthus and we will come back to his ideas because they are very important for Darwinian theory and influenced one of the three major principles of evolution that Darwin came up with but so these are you know like just three examples of religious thinkers that strongly influenced Darwin and there were others I, I broadly called them biologists because they had to do with the study of nature first and foremost we have to talk about um, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and we have to talk about him because he came up with the first scientific theory of evolution we will go into the details a bit more but I just quickly want to you know mention some general principles he was um, obviously um, a French scholar and he was in charge of the the plants in the royal gardens so during the French Revolution he was taking uh, care of the gardens and soon after in, at the turn of the the century so 1801 he first published his ideas of evolution bringing together a lot of the popular ideas that were around at that time and synthesizing them uh, in a, into a coherent body of knowledge and then later on in 1809 he you know expanded on it in his uh, zoological philos philosophy and his idea centered around m two main ideas the first one is that there's a linear progression towards increasing complexity so any kind of species will over time attempt to increase in complexity move towards more beauty this is a very important idea which later on would be picked up by a lot of philosophers and political thinkers and would directly lead to the excesses of social Darwinism at the beginning of the 20th century. The second idea is that the animals adapt, you know, willingly to local conditions through either use or disuse. The, the classic example that people always talk about is the example of a, of a giraffe. So a giraffe is, you know, like grazing happily on in the savanna, and now if a giraffe tries to reach leaves on a on a higher up tree it will stretch it, her neck so and over time this attempt to you know reach those leaves um, will lead to 
a longer neck which then will be passed on over generations to the giraffe's offspring. The, the main idea here is it's, it's a hydraulic theory. So as you can imagine at that time it was the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine was um, the most sophisticated technology that was available at that time and the idea was that body fluids would flow into those organs that are used more frequently and body fluids would be pumped away from those organs that are not used and would therefore shrivel. So the, the idea is as you're trying to reach the, you know, if you're a giraffe and you try to reach those plants, you know, like by trying to reach those plants, more liquid would be pumped into the cells or people had no idea yet of cells, that was a bit later, but would be pumped into the, into the, into the neck. Therefore, the fluids would stretch that neck and that stretched neck now would be passed on to the offspring of the giraffe. So that was really the main idea. So two major ideas. One is there's a linear progression towards more complexity. And the second one is really this hydraulic idea of adaptation to local conditions through either use or disuse. And Darwin first heard about these ideas from a teacher called Robert Edmund Grant when he was up in Edinburgh. So Grant was a free thinker. He was running the Plinian Society. There were a lot of radical thinkers around. And he was the person who inspired Darwin to leave medicine and, you know, dedicate himself to the study of nature. So this is how Darwin was first exposed to those ideas through um, his te or the, the teachings by Grant. Interestingly, Grant was also uh, a great admirer of Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus uh, Darwin, the one who wrote that beautiful poem that I read uh, in the other video. So as you can see, there's an interconnected world of, of people and ideas at that time. So Darwin's grandfather, you know, like writing a poem on, on the possibility of evolution, and then his teacher admiring his, you know, like Darwin's grandfather and being influenced by uh, the French um, biologist Lamarck, and then teaching Darwin the basic principles of, you know, like a scientific theory of evolution at that time. So then there are other people, and I broadly labeled them explorers and philosophers, but of course they're also, you know, like back in those days, you were typically, you know, jack of all trades, you know, these people were naturalists, they were biologists, they were geologists, so astronomers, th th these people, you know, like had typically wide-ranging interests, and I just put them together as kind of explorers or philosophers, but of course they had many other contributions to make to science and research. The first one that I want to talk about is Alexander from Humboldt. One of the reasons I want to talk about him in a little bit more is because he had a profound influence on Darwin, first of all, and also on, on some other uh, thinkers that we will talk about um, in the next few sessions. But also, he really changed the way people were looking at the natural environment. Unfortunately, his influence today is um, people have somewhat lost sight of his contributions and I just want to you know like to give you a bit of an idea of the general feeling of that um, era I want to talk a little bit about um, his life and uh, explorations importantly he well here's first of all um, two pictures one of the the paintings is you know when he was a dashing young uh, fella he he's a Prussian by birth, so Prussia was one of the state German states. Uh, as I had mentioned, at that time there were about um, 39 German dif different German states, and he was working for um, the Prussian uh, king as, as a kind of um, philosopher researcher, and he spent a lot of time in Paris. So he was uh, exposed to a lot of the um, revolutionary ideas in Paris and then later on uh, towards the end of his life he was a professor in, in Berlin at that time and he would write his uh, Magnus Opus called Cosmos where he tried to 
you know like devise a philosophy of life you know that would encompass everything there are lots of very interesting intersections between Humboldt and, and Darwin as well they met at least once and Humboldt at that time was writing on on his uh, final work uh, Cosmos he was working on it for I think close to 20 years and Darwin had uh, already you know traveled on on the Beagle around the world and he was keen to get some insights from Humboldt from his travels and you know like Humboldt was within a few inches of devising his own theory of evolution but um, he wasn't actually paying attention to what Darwin was saying and so missed out on that chance of, of devising his own theory. Humboldt was important because he was really interested in measuring so the idea that you have to observe everything and measure everything in nature that is an idea that Humboldt came up with so he was really the first person to systematically you know before then people would you know like uh, explorers would go, um, travel around would describe what they saw Humboldt was the first one who meticulously measured everything that he saw recorded everything that he saw and that would be pretty much the blueprint for Darwin on the travel on, on the Beagle because he would also start noting down anything and everything that he would see measure as much as possible and so this was you know like an important breakthrough some people have said like Humboldt invented the the idea that there is nature um, and and something that can be studied in a, in a systematic way and the other thing that is really important about Humboldt he was very poetic in his writing so you know there's this um, this little quote here um, nature herself is sublimely eloquent the stars as as they sparkle in firmament fill us with delight and ecstasy and yet they all move in orbit marked out with mathematical precision so he wanted to describe nature in 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 the beauty as it was unfolding in front of his eyes so the books that he wrote were bestsellers and uh, we'll show you one of the the major works um, that he wrote in just a second but at the same time he always emphasized that there is some laws out there some mathematical precision that needs to be discovered and described um, so the important part that really inspired people like Darwin later was Humboldt's trip to the America so he set off in 1799 and he returned in 1804 he traveled through the northern part of South America then through um, the Caribbean all the way up to the United States um, that's where he met uh, Jefferson and they had long debates on for example um, the moral legitimacy of uh, slavery or not Humboldt was very much against slavery Jefferson was in favor of slavery so they had a lot of uh, discussions there and then he returned to uh, France what was you know like Humboldt engaged in a lot of um, scientific experiments so for example he was the first to describe electric eels um, so there's this famous um, episode you know like when I was a kid you know like reading about those stories it was um, very inspiring so he tried to catch eels and obviously they would kill humans with um, their strong voltage so what he did is he asked uh, he bought some horses and he drove the horses into the water till the eels were you know like so tired and, and you know like left off that they didn't have uh, enough electricity anymore to hurt a human so after the horses essentially passed away because you know like they were electrocuted he was able to retrieve them from the water and then he started making uh, all sorts of observations and experiments so he dissected them described the electrical organs and you know like um, experimented on himself you know with the shocks and the, the the strength of the shocks so this this work later very strongly influenced people working with electricity and um, you know like the development of you know like batteries and, and other cool little gadgets that we have these days he also invented um, the whole field of biogeography so he climbed a mountain called Chimborazo and he meticulously measured every every um, all the plants that he would find and at what altitude he would find them so that was a major breakthrough and, and this 
this publication really made big waves um, back in those days both in terms of how bold he was in um, you know exploring nature he climbed up to the top of that mountain and and at the same time also you know like carrying very sensitive instruments so he was able to measure the altitude where he was at and observing um, accurately all the plants that he could find at each level so you know like if you think about it this is already you know, like the starting point of a evolutionary theory because he mused about how plants would be adapted to different levels different at, at um, altitudes it's also interesting that his work was so sophisticated and detailed that researchers today so here's a publication from uh, five years ago 2015 I believe it is um, it was where people used that map and you know like went back to the Shimborazo to see you know, like how have vegetation levels changed and that allowed them to measure and um, you know like look at changes in vegetation so what plants have moved up so you know like what plants have um, increased in terms of their elevation rates where they live and w which plants have disappeared so this is uh, from that publication is um, is an attempt to match the 1802 publication where he laid out all the um, elevation levels for each plants for each of the the plant species against you know like the re visit at um, at the same mountain in 2012 and how the elevation levels have changed so that's pr if you think about it it's a pretty amazing achievement it also you know like people have started noticing people went back to his initial um, you know like sketches and noticed that maybe he inaccurately recorded some of the plans and and observations so people you know followed his tracks and they then challenged some of his observations above uh, the snow line above the tree line so you know like if if you think about it at the beginning of um, explorations it's amazing that his maps were so accurate that to the extent that people can go back now and actually challenge some some of his observations so if you think about open science and um, transparency this is a pretty amazing example so this is really Humboldt and, and his explorations in the Americas at uh, the beginning of the 19th century and in 1814 he wrote his very famous book the personal narrative of a journey to the equinoctial regions of the new continent and this book became really an inspiring source for for Darwin and this book you know he took it on his voyage um, around the world on the Beagle but so, um, there are some observations that you know this was actually the last book that Darwin looked at and read and made made observations um, before he died so it, it was really um, a book that transformed Darwin's life because it motivated him to go on his journey on the Beagle and we also have to talk about John Herschel Herschel is important here's a, a picture of him because he wrote a book called uh, a preliminary discourse on the study of natural philosophy which you know following uh, Humboldt's uh, thinking he argued that philosophy for philosophy or the highest aim of natural philosophy is really to uh, use inductive reasoning um, and you know through observations and then using reasoning to uncover to discover laws of nature um, so he really set up uh, a philosophy that would provide a framework for people to connect observations through reasoning back to to theories and laws and here you know like I just want to give you you know like an idea of you know like how those kind of ideas were conveyed so this is um, from this this book that he wrote in 1831 um, and you know, like I just give you a few seconds here <coughs> 
to peruse through this. So what is really important, I think, here is this, you know, like, if, if you think about it, you know, like, it takes a moment to, to actually read this, you know, like, it's um, two sentences and it's a whole page, right? Um, so, but just to give you an idea of how these ideas were expressed during that time, and even though, you know, like, he wrote um, a philosophical treatment treatment of um, observation um, arguing for you know, like using inductive reasoning to come up or uncover the the laws of nature he was always you know like the the, the idea of a of a of a creator somebody who actually came up with those laws is always there implicit or e explicit in these um, in these observations so this is really important to remember that these um, natural observers, these naturalists that w would go out and, and record the world, observe everything and come up with their theories, were inspired by the idea that this would help them to understand God's design in some way or another. And we have to, of course, mention two individuals that would be very, very um, important for Darwin and would help him to actually protect his ideas when somebody else is about to scoop him. And the first one is Charles Lyell. And Charles Lyell also is important. Here's a picture of him because he's a geologist. Geology was all the rage um, back then. So, you know, like when Darwin came back from his um, travel on, on the Beagle, you know, he he wanted to, you know, like make his mark in in the area of geology. So he was very much inspired by geological thinking at that time. And Lyle, in in a three volume book which was published between 1830 and 1833, he published uh, these principles of geology, which would outline uh, an argument that nature was changing gradually. So before then, you know, like there were all these kind of biblical arguments with the with the f um, great flood, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they would always have this kind of catastrophic, you know, these ca catastrophes that would, you know, like um, radical events that would um, change the world, and then there would be some kind of uh, stasis, and then there would be another radical event. And what Lyell was arguing for that nature is changing gradually and so he also made the argument that earth was older than 6000 years there were all sorts of uh theological arguments around the the um the history of earth how long has earth been around so he made some calculations that challenged the uh, religious views at that time pointing out that earth is actually much much older and the important point here is he argued that there are laws that are unchanging and the laws that are you know like operating on nature at that moment today um, were also in effect you know like thousands and thousands of years before so erosion um, water wind all these forces that change nature uh, volcanoes he argued that all of these forces have always been there and the the forces that act on nature have been the same and at the same time these forces slowly change the planet change earth so this was actually a very important argument for darwin darwin later would say that most of his thinking was channeled through lyle so he he um very much credited lyle for you know like actually proposing the idea that there is a change in nature and that can be studied importantly Lyle argued that humans and plants and animals are excluded from those um, 
you know like ever present laws that can be uh, uncovered that govern earth or you know geology so he was very much against an attempt to explain um living animals and plants through these um laws but darwin took the same idea and then applied these ideas to animals plants and later on to humans and we also have to talk about uh joseph uh, dalton hooker he was younger than darwin he was an explorer and when he returned back from an antarctic um uh voyage after Darwin had returned from his um, trip on the Beagle, he actually entrusted Hooker with describing, you know, like and, and cataloging and, and uh, um, working on all the plants that he had uh, collected. He on initially had collected these plants to send it back to, to his uh, teacher um, back in, in, in Cambridge. But then, you know, like there was so much uh, material available that he asked this, this young explorer, Hooker, to, to look at it. And they became friends and Hooker became very important for Darwin as a sounding board. So a lot of the ideas that Darwin would later publish were, you know, like were checked against uh, conversations and, and letter exchanges with um, Joseph Hooker. And so these are some of the individuals that profoundly influenced Darwin. So if we look at it, you know, like Darwin lived from 1809 uh, till 1882. And so his thinking was strongly influenced by a diversity of sources. So we have religious individuals, William Paley, John Henslow, uh, Malthus. We have biologists like um, Jean Lamarck or Robert Grant. And we have all these explorers like Humboldt, Herschel, Lyell and Hooker. So all of these individuals had ideas that would become very influential and would shape Darwin's thinking as he would slowly develop his theory of evolution. And that is going to be the next one the next uh, important step that we're going to look at.